when we talk about the endocrine system, we have to acknowledge, first of all, that the endocrine system is a very, very complicated system. It consists of a number of different pieces and parts, so we can see here in this graphic, but uh, a couple of things to keep in mind, and one is that things higher in the system typically control things lower in the system. So if we start out with the hypothalamus, it typically controls the pituitary gland. The pituitary then typically controls the thyroid. The thyroid goes out and controls the rest of the body. So literally, the further down in the body you go, the more layers of control you have above that. And they're all interacting with each other, but they're all taking their orders ultimately from the hypothalamus. So an endocrinologist who is actually good must keep in mind all these different interactions from top to bottom and back and forth and in between and everything else. So it's really, really a complicated area of specialty. Some other things we want to understand about the endocrine system, and that is that it produces hormones, and those hormones then affect cells. And they affect only the cells that they're supposed to affect. And what we see here is these two cells on the left, they're the target cells. They're the cell that that particular hormone is supposed to do something to, and they have receptors on them. And those receptors only fit with a particular hormone. So other hormones could come in contact with those receptors, but cause no impact whatsoever because they didn't line up. So they didn't then act on that particular cell. The non-target cell over on the right there has a receptor on it that is different than that particular hormone shape, so it doesn't fit and it is unaffected by that thing. So that hormone could go all throughout the body and actually encounter every cell in the body, but only cause perhaps a fairly small number of cells to respond. And so that's a nice thing in that it can go everywhere, but it only does what it's supposed to do to the cells it's supposed to do it to. Here's a list of those different uh, endocrine glands, the primary glands. And this is sort of interesting because it tells you what hormone it produces or releases and then where that uh, hormone will act and what it does. And that start of, sort of starts to help you get the idea that uh, it's very much a top-down trickle effect but also can circle back through. So it's just an interesting look at that particular table. Uh, feel free to do that on your own time if you'd like. So here's again that idea of receptor. And in this particular kind of hormone would be a non-fat-based hormone. So a peptide hormone, so a protein-based hormone. Meaning that it's not made out of fat, so it must have the receptor protein on the outside of the cell. And when it attaches, that then triggers a chain reaction. But in that case, the hormone itself doesn't go into the target cell, but rather it just started a series of reactions inside the cell by attaching to the outside. So sort of a trigger or a catalyst for a series of reactions. And that's how non-fat-based hormones would work. If we look at a fat-based hormone, in this case it's called a steroid hormone, that steroid hormone, because it is fat-based, easily diffuses through the cell membrane. So it doesn't attach to a receptor on the cell surface, but rather it enters the cell, enters the nucleus, and then there are receptor proteins inside the nucleus that either pick it up and then have a series of reactions that occur afterwards, or if there's not a receptor protein for it, it's not picked up, nothing happens, and off you go. So both of those different ways the process is triggered, the difference being what's it made out of. If it's fat-based, it will take this approach here. If it was non-fat-based, it would take the previous approach. We used to think that the pituitary gland was the master control gland of the body, but now we know that's not quite correct. Actually, the hypothalamus is the master control gland, and everything else in some form or fashion gets its orders from there. So we can say, first of all, that the hypothalamus makes a number of things itself and then sends them to the pituitary gland for storage, specifically the posterior pituitary. 
So it's going to make ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which will be stored in the posterior pituitary and eventually released to have an impact on the kidneys and urine production. It makes uh, oxytocin, which again is stored in the posterior pituitary, and would have effects on the uterus and mammary glands in females when it comes to the idea of labor and giving birth and to the idea of uh, producing breast milk. So those two hormones will be stored in the posterior pituitary until they're ready to be released. So we can say that the posterior pituitary doesn't make any hormones on its own. It just serves as a storage and release point for things made by the hypothalamus and they're just released whenever they're needed. If we looked at the anterior pituitary, it's a little bit different in that it makes uh, some hormones on its own, but it also gets its orders from the hypothalamus. So hypothalamic releasing and inhibiting hormones are produced by the hypothalamus. They go to the pituitary, the anterior pituitary, and either turn on its production of its hormones or turn off its productions of the hormones. And it makes a number of different hormones. We see a couple of them listed here. It produces thyroid stimulating hormone, which then tells the thyroid gland to turn on or turn off. And that's really the, re the main regulator of your metabolism. So the uh, thyroid is the metabolism endocrine gland, but it's getting its orders from the pituitary. So if you have unusual weight gain or weight loss, the doctor will probably look at thyroid hormone levels. But they also need to consider that uh, the pituitary is involved in the process, as is the hypothalamus. So wherever the problem occurs, they usually have to work from there back up into the system, trying to find where exactly things got off. Uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone is going to go down and turn on the adrenal gland, located on top of the kidneys, and that will do a number of things that we'll get to in a little bit. It's also going to be involved in prolactin, and prolactin is another hormone that's going to be involved in milk production in the mammary glands. So prolactin plus oxytocin gives uh, breast milk production. Growth hormone is a really big, really important one here. That's going to be involved in causing body tissues to grow. So when children especially are growing quickly, we say that maybe they're growing through a growth spurt. Really what that means is that their body is releasing a lot of growth hormone right now, resulting in increased growth and metabolism of tissues. And then the uh, reproductive organs, the ovaries and the testes, will get uh, some follicular stimulating hormone and some luteinizing hormone, so FSH and LH, and those will trigger uh, things like egg development and ovulation, it will trigger production of either estrogen or testosterone, and then the uh, production of sperm, if that's appropriate, or eggs, as the case may be. So those things uh, are all going on, all a process triggered by the anterior pituitary when it got orders from the hypothalamus to go ahead and make it and do it. So here's just an example of those interactions. I said it was complicated. So hypothalamus tells the pituitary to do something. The pituitary tells the thyroid to do something. The thyroid does something. Then it feeds back to the pituitary, which turns off some things. It feeds back to the hypothalamus, which turns off some things. So yes, uh, it was a trickle-down effect, but it does feed back up the system and eventually turn things off at a higher level. And again, a very, very complicated sets of interactions. And some of them we don't fully understand exactly how and why they're doing what they're doing, but it does make an endocrinologist's job that much more tricky when there are so many different levels of interaction going on. Probably one of the more dramatic things that happens with imperfections of the amount of hormone produced and released is exhibited with the idea of growth hormone. So this individual here is nearly twice the height of those uh, others around him. And so that would obviously be abnormal in that situation. So this individual is suffering from what we would call pituitary gigantism, in which his pituitary gland produced and released too much growth hormone. And the body simply grows when growth hormone is there and slows down when it's not. So for him, his body made too much 
it then grew relative to that and he achieved that much higher than average height. Now if you see the feet there, those feet are really big. They don't look perhaps that big on him, but it's all relative. Probably half again at least bigger than the average person's foot. What you do notice there is that uh, he's got those two canes, or uh, walking sticks if you will. So what happens when the body gets that tall and that big is that it really can't support itself very well. So you don't really move incredibly freely on your own. You need extra support every place you can get it. In this case, using the arms to help hold up and support the body becomes necessary. Along the way, you often see these individuals. They don't usually live much past half a normal lifespan because the body is not designed to be that big and really hold together. Things fall apart. Things go wrong. Things get off especially because it was caused by a level of things being off, it tends to throw other things off as well. So often these individuals uh, have some sort of heart problem because the heart really can't support that much body tissue very well. So tall is, in this case, extremely tall. This individual is probably around the 8-foot mark. Uh, probably not necessarily something that you would want because it would have more complications and more problems than it would have benefits. Now, if the level of growth hormone is high, when you're actually growing as a child, you get what we just saw. But what happens if that level of growth hormone remains too high after bone growth stops? So after you, uh, your vertical height stops, if those levels of growth hormone are still too high, the body will continue to grow, but it will no longer grow in a proportional manner. So what you see at the top, there's a normal hand and then an acromegaly hand at the bottom. So we call acromegaly is basically pituitary giganticism that is continued after the end of bone growth. And again, the bones and body keep growing, but they don't do so proportionately, so they start getting disproportionate. You can see the hands there, especially at the joints, are still growing. They're getting not only really long fingers and hands, but they're also very knobby. And the further that goes, the more thickened and inflexible that hand will become. If you look at this individual here, he looks to be quite tall. And if you look at the hands, they're getting a little bit knobby. But as that individual goes farther, the face, especially the cheekbones and jawbone and forehead, will become very abnormally shaped. So if you think Andre the Giant, if you are into old wrestling, that would work. If you're into wrestling these days, it's more of a big show. Or the Great Kali, for example, they both have acromegaly. So it tends to very much distort the face, and it becomes quite unattractive per se. Tony Robbins is a motivational speaker. He has acromegaly, and his face and jaw is getting really big and protruding. He's probably spending a lot of money trying to suppress that, but it's still uh, becoming uh, visible. If you're a movie buff, perhaps you would remember the villain Jaws from uh, some of the old James Bond films. Uh, he had acromegaly, so that very distorted big jaw and, and cheek and facial structures was normal for him. Uh, if you would have been a, more of a George Clooney fan, perhaps you'd remember the movie Intolerable Cruelty with Catherine Zeta-Jones, and the guy that George Clooney hires to kill his uh, problematic wife at that point, I believe it was, Wheezy, also had acromegaly, and his face was very distorted along with that. Well, so a lot of these folks have become actors or something like that, because deep down there is a demand for distorted, quote-unquote, ugly faces, for monster-type faces, and uh, it just naturally occurs from this. Uh, probably the um, Frankenstein actors, back when uh, Frankenstein first came out, uh, probably had acromegaly as well, and so their face was already somewhat like that, and it maybe was just exaggerated a little bit more with makeup. So along the way, uh, you've probably seen quite a number of these without necessarily knowing what it was. It was simply too much growth hormone after uh, bones stop getting longer. These days, that's treatable. So if you're going to the doctor when you're growing up as a kid, like you should, they'll catch these sorts of things. 
and then they can give you some medications that will help to balance it out and prevent this abnormal level of growth. Down in the thyroid gland. Normally the thyroid gland is about the size of a walnut, but you can see in this picture A, the thyroid gland has been more along the lines of a grapefruit, and that's not normal. So that's considered a goiter. In that particular case, the thyroid gland and its hormones require large amounts of iodine. And if your diet is iodine deficient, you develop this essentially an iodine deficiency goiter. You don't typically see this here in the United States because we consume large amounts of iodized salt. And that's why most salt is iodized, is to prevent an iodine deficiency in the diet so that then the endocrine system can do an easier job of uh, making enough thyroid hormone. So in this case, the thyroid is responding by saying, I don't have enough iodine, therefore I'm not making enough of the hormone, so if I get bigger, maybe that'll solve the problem. So it becomes bigger, sort of enlarged and swollen, just like in starving people, often their liver becomes enlarged, and then it looks like they're fat when really it's just an enlarged liver. In this case, the thyroid is trying to compensate for lack of production by getting bigger. Obviously not working. So the solution in this case would be to provide iodine in the diet. So in areas of the world where there's very little iodine in the soil, then there's typically very little iodine in those people's diets and you have that sort of problem. But as long as we're eating iodized salt here in the United States, you're probably not going to see that. Now, there is a trend towards things like sea salt and Himalayan rock salt, and these other silly things, and some of those are iodine-free salts. And in that case, if we switch too much to that sort of thing in our diet, we might actually experience an iodine deficiency. So I wouldn't recommend the iodine-free salts because it is something that is necessary for your body to have to work properly. And salt is the probably the biggest place, the simp certainly the simplest place, for our body to get it. In picture B here, this is congenital hypothyroidism. So the, the thyroid gland is underactive. And if it happens in a baby... It's a real problem there, and uh, what you're going to see is this. This baby, its mouth isn't developed properly, it's puffy and swollen, its forehead isn't right, its hair is too thin, just a number of things about this baby are not right. And that's because the thyroid gland is underactive. And unless they catch that very, very quickly in the first couple of months, really, after birth, it will actually result in some developmental problems physically, but also intellectually. And so that individual will start to suffer intellectual impairment because their thyroid gland isn't producing enough thyroid hormone. So, and it also turns out that for the, let's say, the reproductive organs to fully develop, they need to have reproductive hormones, but they also have to have appropriate levels of thyroid hormone. So if the thyroid's not working here, it's going to then further impact their uh, body's reproductive development further on down the road. So it's a huge set of cascading problems here. Another reason to take babies, especially in the first couple of years after they're born, to the doctor when you're supposed to, and these are the sorts of things that they're looking for to make sure that they aren't happening. Because if they are, the sooner they're found, the sooner they can be treated and corrected, and uh, the fewer side effects you would experience along the way. In adults, uh, if hypothyroidism occurred, it would be called myxedema. You would be tired, you would gain weight, you would lose your hair, uh, body temperature would be lower, and the skin perhaps would become puffy. And so this would basically be an underactive thyroid causing you to gain weight. So unexplained gain weight, unexplained swelling, things like that, very easily could be a thyroid problem. Our bottom picture here is the development of a goiter, in this case, behind the eyes. So this is an example of hyperthyroidism, and specifically this is Graves' disease. 
And in this case, there's an overactive thyroid gland, too much thyroid hormone, and it produces these uh, goiters, these swollen masses of tissue. And typically behind the eyes is where you see this. So it's very clear that this person's left eye is bulging out. The one on the right is fairly normal. So in that case, um, you might have uh, hyperactivity, nervous, uh, might not sleep well, things like that. And uh, it can be treated by surgical manipulation of the thyroid gland, perhaps uh, take out a piece of thyroid gland. And so what's left in its overactive state produces just the right amount. Or it could be a tumor or something else. So uh, the doctors can figure out what's causing that and do something about it these days. You don't typically have to suffer from that forever if you don't want to. The regulation of calcium in the blood is a really important thing, and it's involving the thyroid gland, and right behind the thyroid gland is a set of four small glands called the parathyroid glands. And when blood calcium levels get too low, parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone, which then triggers the bones to release calcium, and the kidneys will also try to absorb more calcium from urine and not let it go. The intestines uh, will um, get involved in that because the uh, vitamin D will be activated and formed, and that then stimulates the intestines to be more absorptive to calcium. So when you look at milk these days, it often will tell you about the calcium in there, but it usually says vitamin D fortified. And what that means is that they've added vitamin D to the milk to allow the calcium to be more readily absorbed by the intestines. Because the intestines don't do a really great job of absorbing calcium, but if they add vitamin D with it, that helps to get more of that calcium from the milk absorbed into the intestines, and then it's more available to the body. So it's actually making the milk more easily absorbable, more useful for the human body than it would be without the vitamin D. All those things together are going to get the blood calcium levels back up, at which point the parathyroid glands slow down the release of parathyroid hormone. If uh, blood calcium levels are too high, the thyroid gland re releases some calcitonin, which tells the body to take calcium out of the blood, put it into bones, and away you go there. So it's a, a delicate balance that's happening 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This little balance is going back and forth between parathyroid and thyroid function to keep blood calcium levels right where they need to be. When we talk about the adrenal glands, we talk about stress because the adrenal glands produce, as it would sound like, adrenaline, and that gets involved in a stress response. So we're talking about epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is what we used to call adrenaline. And that's going to be involved, and when that happens, those levels go up. We have the heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, blood sugar levels go up, and those things help to produce more active, more energized muscles and more rapid whole body responses to that stressor. So it actually energizes, it's sort of like a temporary steroid sort of effect that allows us to hopefully survive the experience. But once that stressor is over, those levels will go back down and things would return to normal. So that would be a short-term stress, like, uh, I don't know, you're told you're going to have a quiz that you weren't quite ready for, perhaps. And so that's a stressor that lasts only until the quiz is over and perhaps a little afterwards, but not much. And then it would uh, go back down to normal. Long-term stress, and there's lots and lots of different examples of what might cause long-term stress, have some a little bit different effects here. Uh, it's sort of interesting. They're mentioning here glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. And glucocorticoids are involved in blood sugar re regulation and uh, that side of stress response. Mineralocorticoids are involved in uh, regulation of salts and electrolytes. And so here they say that the long-term stress response is protein and fat metabolism instead of glucose. And that sounds, the well, not necessarily problematic, but really what happens is short-term stress results in an increase in metabolism, 
Long-term stress really slows down metabolism. So being stressed for a little bit, it, I suppose, helps to lose weight just a little bit. But if you're stressed for long periods, the metabolism, and it's shifting, slows down its processes as well. And uh, stays in that life or death scenario, which ultimately slows down your metabolism, causing a person to lose weight. At first, but then long term gain that weight and probably a whole lot more afterwards. The immune system is suppressed when you have long term levels of glucocorticoids high. And it uh, mentions here reduction of inflammation. That's sort of interesting because long term you actually get more inflammation than you had before. Uh, because what you're really having is you're having high blood sugar levels. So when you're switching to the fat and protein metabolism, blood sugar goes up, and that ultimately causes inflammation and swelling and some problems. So across the board, high levels of glucocorticoids for long periods, not good. Uh, mineralocorticoids, uh, in terms of long-term functionality, it's not quite such a big deal there in terms of negative effects. Uh, you might have a little bit of fluid retention as you're retaining more salt, and then that forces water retention by the body. Uh, you would have perhaps blood pressure go up long term, so that would really be the contributing problem uh, of mineralocorticoids is just high blood sugar. Or not, sorry, not blood sugar, high blood pressure. But you get the high blood sugar from the glucocorticoids. So uh, anyway, long term stress is something it would be nice if we could avoid because it causes these metabolic problems long term. And also cause some cardiovascular system problems long term if you don't get them fixed as well. Here we have Addison's disease. The person on the left, those two hands are very tanned. The person on the right with the one hand has a normally pigmented hand. And so this individual is not just spending lots of time in the sun. This would be somebody who'd been inside all winter. So no sun exposure, their skin still looks like this when they would be expected to have skin looking like the hand on the right. And what happens here is it's an abnormal bronzing of the skin. It's a result of this problem, this Addison's disease. In this case, uh, glucocorticoids are low. So the adrenal gland is not making enough glucocorticoids. And that messes up blood sugar regulation. And a visible thing is this bronzing of the skin. It's hard to find true color photographs, but John F. Kennedy, a former president, probably most famous for being shot in Dallas, actually suffered from this. So it, it made him look like he was tanned all the time. And perhaps that's what Marilyn Monroe and many, many other women found so attractive about him. Those of you who aren't up on your history, JFK was a big womanizer. He had lots and lots of affairs while in the White House. And uh, Marilyn Monroe just happened to be the most famous, uh, I guess, Bill Clinton's Monica Lewinsky. Uh, but uh, Marilyn was actually attractive and far more famous than Monica Lewinsky ever was. But uh, perhaps that's what the women found so attractive was that perpetual tanned appearance. But along with that, because you can't properly regulate blood sugar levels, that really means you can't respond to stress appropriately. So... His body would not have handled stressors well. Water balance would be off, sugar balance would be off, all those things would be messed up. So when he was shot, those were probably fatal to anybody kind of injuries. But for him, they would have been even more fatal because his body would not have properly adjusted itself trying to balance out those injuries, trying to regulate that fluid loss and that sort of thing. So he was extra certain to die from it, and a much lesser wound would have probably been fatal for him as well because of that metabolic problem with his adrenal gland. This is an adrenal gland, but it's not supposed to look like this. It's supposed to be nice and smooth and pink, and it's not supposed to have all these tan lumps in it. Now, those are actually tumors. And those uh, tumors of the adrenal gland means the adrenal gland isn't properly making things like it's supposed to. And we're going to call that Cushing's syndrome. And it can cause things like this. So what you see are the redness of the face there. That's not normal. Sort of a perpetual flushed appearance. 
a very puffy face. There's a lot of fluid accumulation, probably some metabolic issues and fat accumulation. Uh, if you look at the eyes, it looks like they've got a little bit of some goiter issues going on behind them there. Uh, so kind of all the problems we've mentioned so far with the adrenal gland somewhat show up in some form or fashion here with Cushing's. Now, that's typically in caused by tumor on the pituitary, and, or not the pituitary, sorry, the adrenal gland. And uh, if it's just one or two tumors, that can be surgically removed or dealt with, and then that would fix the problem. Within a couple of months, probably these would uh, symptoms would go away and the person would look completely normal. Uh, the adrenal gland we saw in the previous picture there was probably not something that was surgically treatable. That had so many tumors in it, to do anything with that at all, you just have to take out the whole adrenal gland. And, uh, well, that's not really something that we want to think about if we don't have to. So, uh, there's probably more of a medical kind of approach you would take in terms of using medications to try to manipulate behaviors of the gland to try to get straightened out there. Probably the most famous of the pituitary or the endocrine glands is the pancreas. And the pancreas is famous because everybody knows if you have diabetes you have a pancreas problem. And that's uh, mostly a correct statement. But what we see here in this image is a islet of Langerhans. And that's uh, where you're going to see the production of insulin and that sort of thing. So we can say generically that the pancreas is responsible for helping to regulate blood sugar levels by either producing and releasing insulin or glucagon. Everybody knows the pancreas produces insulin and that lowers blood sugar, but what you may not know is that pancreas also has a blood sugar raising function with glucagon. And when that is released, that stimulates the uh, release of sugar into the blood, raising blood sugar. So if it's in between meals, it's been a while since you ate, blood sugar starts to go down a little bit, the pancreas can release glucagon and that will raise blood sugar levels so it will metabolize and process sugar into the system and if the blood sugar levels get too high let's say during or after a meal and even for a non-diabetic blood sugar levels can get too high uh, the insulin just simply takes and stimulates that sugar to go into the cells so uh, normally that's not a really big spike that you would see in a blood sugar test because it when properly functioning would do that pretty quickly. In the world of diabetes there are two flavors of diabetes. Type 1 is uh, typically something that you're born with and um, and that's usually when the pancreas is not making enough insulin. Uh, and uh, really type 2 also is a problem with not enough insulin but type 2 we can say is something that often occurs as an adult meaning your lifestyle led to its development. So you could generically say that you ate yourself into type 2 diabetes for the most part. Uh, and with that, uh, fat tissue interferes with insulin per function, and it might not be that you don't have enough insulin, but your cells have become what we call insulin resistant. That means when the insulin comes in contact with the cell, the little receptors that are there that are supposed to stimulate the cell to take in sugar, don't take in sugar and uh, then your blood sugar levels stay higher and you we say you ate yourself into it because basically you desensitize the cell you gave it so much sugar so many times over and over and over through life far too much that uh, it just became non-responsive it kind of got worn out and said you know I can't really respond to this anymore because it's that way all the time and so the treatment of that after the fact is uh, just to manage your diet and you may become uh, needing insulin uh, treatments. If you're lucky though with that you can regulate it just by carefully managing your diet and uh, throwing some exercise when needed. There's not really a cure for diabetes. I know some doctors claim that if you get a gastric bypass procedure that will cure diabetes. I do not believe that at all. 
Uh, what that does is it reduces the amount of sugar that you can possibly put in the system at one time, which would then minimize the sugar swings back and forth. So it might be that the diabetes appears to be not a problem, when really you've just been surgically forced to reduce sugar consumption. So, so surgically, by diet, you're regulating your problem, not necessarily making the in, the pancreas work like it's supposed to, not really changing the sensitivity of cells to insulin, but just producing uh, or entering less sugar into the system, so there's less likelihood of a, a sugar high or that sort of thing. So uh, I would caution that the idea of gastric bypass curing diabetes it's just surgically treating the symptoms. To do a test for diabetes, unfortunately this is necessary quite often, is you would take a pretty good slug of, of sugar, basically sugar water, and then over the course of a couple of hours they're going to monitor that blood sugar and see what happens. So if you consumed a lot of sugar and you're pancreas is working like it's supposed to, your cells are appropriately responding to insulin like they're supposed to, what you'll see is that bottom light blue line. So the threshold or the amount of urine that, or rather the amount of sugar that has to be present in the blood for it to show up in urine, uh, remember the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidneys is responsible for glucose reabsorption. So as long as it stays below 200 milligrams there in the blood, the proximal convoluted tubule is able to keep up with that. But if it goes past that to above 200 or so, then it's going to start showing up in the urine. But in a non-diabetic whose system is properly functioning, that sugar might go up to 150 or so, but probably not much past that, and it won't stay there for very long. So it doesn't go past the threshold at which it shows up in the urine. And fairly quickly after that, the sugar level will go back down to what it was before you uh, ingested that large slug of it. There's another form of diabetes called gestational diabetes caused by uh, metabolic imperfections and abnormalities during pregnancy. Um, that puts the child at risk for some metabolic problems. It produce, puts the mother at risk for some metabolic problems. Uh, typically, after the baby is born, uh, the mama's problems go away, but it does uh, put that mama probably at a greater risk of developing that form of diabetes again with another pregnancy or with developing type 2 diabetes later on. So uh, blood sugar regulation during pregnancy is something you should keep a look at. And the doctor should be monitoring for that sort of thing as well. It's amazing how many things are treatable if you actually go to the doctor to get checked. When we talk about the reproductive structures, we've mentioned the idea of FSH and LH. And so again, that came from the hypothalamus, went through the pituitary glands, then got down to the testes or the ovaries. In the case of testes, that's going to stimulate the production of testosterone, which will then feed back to the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus and, and balance out there. And then when testosterone levels are appropriate, sperm production levels are appropriate. If testosterone levels are too low, then sperm production will be low as well. If someone is having fertility issues when the male gets tested, this is the first thing they look at is sperm levels. And if sperm levels are low, then they'll look at testosterone levels as a potential explanation for that, which would then feed back to the pituitary and the hypothalamus. From the female perspective, FSH and LH are going to trigger the production of estrogen and progesterone, which then stimulates egg production, stimulates ovulation, and also runs the menstrual cycle. And we'll learn about that when we get to the reproductive system later on. But then those would feed back to the pituitary and the hypothalamus as well. So as long as that system is in balance, males are appropriately producing sperm, females are appropriately ovulating, uh, producing eggs, that sort of thing, and life is good. We should also say that those hormones 
are involved in the development of secondary sexual characteristics. So what makes someone appear male or appear female is what we're talking about with secondary sexual characteristics. So uh, hair and where is it? Uh, voice, is it high, is it low? Uh, body shape in terms of where does fat go and what shape does that make it or not? Uh, the development of a penis or a clitoris. Uh, the uh, lots and lots of things go on with those secondary uh, sexual characteristics and, and all of that's coming from this hormone uh, interaction stuff as well. There are a number of other small productions of hormones and, and minor players. One thing we'll consider right here is the pineal gland and its production of melatonin. Now, melatonin is actually involved in regulating your sleep and awake cycle. So if you allow your body to get into a pattern, it will become sleepy at a particular time of day. You'll wake up at a particular time of day, and you can actually become so programmed that plus or minus five minutes of the same time every morning you might wake up. And if you have children, that's not often an option to become programmed like that. But when I was in college living in the dorms, I discovered that I would wake up every morning plus or minus two minutes of the same time without an alarm clock every day plus or minus two minutes. So that was a pretty precise pr uh, process. But really what we find out here is that the pineal gland makes melatonin, which makes you feel sleepy or makes you wake up. So as levels increase, you feel sleepy. As levels decrease, you wake up. And so what they found here is that if you look at winter time and summer time, with the two little check marks there being six in the morning and six at night, what they found was that uh, the environmental light levels then manipulated the body's production because when environmental light goes down, melatonin production goes up. When environmental light goes up, melatonin production goes down, literally within a matter of minutes sometimes. And so when it gets dark outside, you feel sleepy. When it gets light outside, you wake up. Meaning some people have a hard time sleeping when it's not dark because their body isn't producing very much melatonin and that wasn't helping them stay awake or stay asleep in that case. What's also interesting here is the shift from winter to summer. So as the seasons change and we adjust our clocks, in the fall when it starts getting dark earlier, as soon as it starts getting dark we start feeling like it's time to go to bed. Because our body actually believes it is time to go to bed because the decrease in light actually increases melatonin production and the body starts shutting down. So those seasonal changes often interfere with people's sleep cycles and programmings because the environmental light is impacting their sleep hormone. So sometimes you find that people sleep better if you put blinds on the windows. Uh, my children uh, definitely need it dark to sleep. They don't sleep very well in the light, especially in the second half early in the morning. Uh, but in the winter time, when it gets dark at, let's say, uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, or sometimes right around there, at least for a little while until our bodies adjust, our bodies really get thrown out of whack. And that's because of this light interaction affecting our endocrine system and its function. There are a number of other, a uh, little bit more minor functionalities with the endocrine system that you'll read about as you read the text material. But this is sort of a quick and dirty overview of the system and how it works. So hopefully you understood everything and learned a lot along the way. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.